welcome everyone to this new Datadog on session. Uh, so just so you know, Datadog is a series of uh, events in which we invite engineers, designers, product managers uh, working every day here at Datadog to talk to us about something they're working on. It could be a technology, it could be um, a process, it could be even a product. Um, and uh, today we are going to be talking about data inform uh, product development. Um, this one, this this episode, and uh, is going to be recorded just as every other episode. So if you want to see the recordings of previous episodes, you can go to our website datadoc.datadoc.hq.com. Uh, so, some housekeeping be items before we get started. So. Um, we are going to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the very end for questions. Uh, we want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. Uh, that's what makes them very, very fun to, to, to come and, and attend. Uh, so if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button uh, in your Zoom client. You can open that uh, Q&A and leave the question there. You don't have to wait until the very end. I uh, just drop your question there um, and then we will try to cover them as um, as many as, as we can at the very end. Uh, there is also a chat window uh, in your Zoom client. So if you want to say hello, if you want to say where, where you're coming from, feel free to do so, to comment throughout the session as well. Uh, the only thing what, I, what I'm asking is if you have a question, instead of putting on the chat window, uh, put it then on the Q&A so we don't, we don't miss it. Good. Uh, so let's let's get started. Um, so before we get started, usually we uh, we present a little bit Datadog. Uh, Datadog is a monitoring and security platform that helps companies improve observability and security of their infrastructure and applications. Um, my name is Harapalida. I'm a developer advocate here at Datadog. And I'm also one of the co-hosts and co-organizers of Data.com. So if you have any feedback or any suggestions on topics that you would like us to cover, uh, feel free to reach out um, and, and we will um, be back to you. But the important people today uh, are Miranda and Derek. Um, Miranda, do you want to introduce yourself? Unmute myself. Hello. Uh, my name is Miranda. Um, I'm one of the product managers here at Datadog. Um, I've, I've, I've worked here for about three and a half years, uh, working on a variety of different products uh, that, you know, I'll share a little bit more about our experiences. Good. Uh, Derek? Hey, yeah, I'm Derek. Um, I'm a staff product designer here at Datadog. I've uh, been here for almost seven years um, and I've for the last three and a half or so have worked on uh, our design ops team since we founded it and that team um, basically is sort of a cross-functional team between design and front-end engineering. Uh, we were responsible for building and evolving and maintaining and growing our um, design system which sort of powers uh, the fundamental layer of a lot of the Datadog platform, the Datadog web app. Um, as well as a bunch of internal tools and applications and things like that that we have. Before I was on Design Ops uh, many years ago, I worked on a bunch of different parts of Datadog before that. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to uh, to share some of what, we, what we've learned and, and how we use Datadog ourselves to, to do this kind of thing. Fantastic. So I'm super excited about this one. Miranda and Derek are uh, super experienced uh, professionals. So this is, is going to be um, a, definitely a good, very good episode. Uh, so to kick things off, uh, a little bit about the scale that, that we work on, um, just so you know why we're making these this, uh, episodes and, and, and how we are working on a daily basis. So Teladoc has um, more than 18,000 customers and obviously we are a monitoring platform. So we basically collect data uh, from our customers' infrastructure and, and applications, and that adds to millions of hosts, um, which translate in trillions of data points per day that we need to process and we need to make sure they're available uh, for our customers to, to query. And uh, those data points uh, have very different formats. Some are logs, metrics, et cetera. Uh, today, we are going to be focusing more on, on two types of this uh, telemetry, which are uh, RAM and session replay. 
So let's dive into, into our topic, data informed product development. And why, uh, while we were building this episode, uh, at the beginning, we were thinking about um, calling it data, data driven product development. That's the idea that I proposed to Derek and Miranda. And they told me right straight away that uh, it's not data driven, it's more data informed. And they repeated this over and over again because they, they kept saying, uh, that uh, data is just one of the tools that, that we use. Can, can uh, you follow up a little bit more on, on that? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, so one of the things that um, we think about when we are, are building a product is, is not just to completely follow the numbers. We want to know what people need. And what people need isn't necessarily reflected in um, just raw metrics. Uh, we need to know the nuance, like what are people struggling with? What are people, what, what's something that's going to help uh, a person's day-to-day -day life? Um, and, you know, data can be used to inform that, but I agree, it's simply one of the tools. Um, and probably our biggest tool is is conversations that we're having with people, understanding what is a challenge on the day-to-day. -day. Cool. What do you think, Derek? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think like, you know, it's, uh, data is something, I think we'll talk about this in a little while, but it's, it's something to help us, you know, address hypotheses that we form um, from, yeah, like you said, talking to customers, talking to our users, um, uh, using the product ourselves, which we'll talk about too a bit. Um, and it's not something that we sort of just follow blindly or um, over index on in, in cases where, um, you know, we have a, a gut feeling or, you know, a hypothesis, like I said, it's a tool to help flesh that kind of thing out. Um, and yeah, I was, I was particularly uh, uh, adamant that we shouldn't call it data driven because I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a piece of it, but it's not, it's not the uh, the driving piece of it. So sounds good. Um, I, I love it. By the way, uh, how we changed the the title. Um, so so what do you do on on a day to day so people understand what's what's your job at Tarara? Yeah. So um, each individual team within Datadog is kind of. Uh, uh, group together something like this, uh, depending on the team. But um, you know, a team together is working to solve a problem. They're solving. Um, you know, they're trying to help a customer do one thing or a set of things, um, and the different team members are focusing on it in, in slightly different, you know, uh, views. So, product is going to be looking at, you know how can we make the biggest impact on the most number of customers? Design is making sure that those workflows are extremely tight and are easy for people to build. And engineering is, you know, working on how do we architect this in the, in the fastest way. But um, each of these groups are all stakeholders in the same common problem. Um, we're just looking at it from just different aspects and there's a lot of crossover. Um, so if, uh, you know, the page is slow, then um, the user experience might be impacted or um, more people don't want to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a lot of impacts that each of the team members have on the overall product. Um, uh, Derek works on the design portion, so I'll let you speak to how you view things. Well, yeah, and I, I think the sort of really interesting thing here is like even, for example, within design, you know, we've got design is one of the, the parts of this Venn diagram here and, you know, one of the sides of this triangle. But like even within that, there's a lot of um, sort of distinction or nuance. So like I work on the design ops team, like I said a few minutes ago, and we're sort of cross-functional. We're like designers and engineers working in a pretty technical way, and we're working on, um, you know, some of these things that are really foundational across the whole platform. Um, you know, these components, these these pieces, these elements of our UI that are shared, you know, and, and reused all across the platform. And then some other designers are, and so we work with, you know, both the engineers within our team and then product managers, engineers from all throughout all these other product teams too. Um, some other designers are working more specifically on a specific day-to-day -day feature or product, um, and they're working closely with, you know, 
a, a core set of PM or a PMs and an engineer or, and you know engineers front end and sometimes back end. Um, and so it's there's there's sort of a, a bunch of different angles that we can that we sort of view this this stuff through in this this relationship and then you know how we use data to to inform all this kind of thing. So yeah. Nice. Uh, so um, one one of the things that that you've been discussing from the beginning is that obviously one of your goals is to make sure that you understand uh, the users' problems and also um, what they the the tasks that they want to perform and and make sure that there there is the best way that they can perform it. So those optimal key user workflows. Uh, how do you come up with those? How do you know? Um. <laughs> when we were when we were talking about this this kind of question, um, uh, Derek and I were saying we just know, um, kind of in a jokingly manner, <laughs> uh, but the it, it sound it can sound a little bit you know um, maybe arrogant, but what it actually means and in our minds is actually like we've talked to so many different people and we've had so many different customer conversations. Um, that we see very strong patterns uh, in what people want and what people, you know, try and use with the product. So we don't really just know. Uh, it comes from spending a lot of time looking at exactly what are people doing, how do people want to use the product, um, what are their motivations, um, and so you know, these things help us form a hypothesis. It'll usually be a strongly held hypothesis, but um, we use data to confirm, like help confirm that hypothesis before we uh, actually move forward with building a product. Yeah, I like that, that concept of, of first having an hypothesis and then, uh, so first you know, kind of, and then you confirm it or uh, the opposite. Uh, so to, to put an example to attendees of, of what type of workflows are we are we thinking here? Um, this, uh, this example graph from, from anywhere is, could be one of these uh, workflows that, that we're talking and talking about. Um, what is a graph from anywhere? Yeah, so um, graph from anywhere was something that um, we built a little while ago um, and the foundations of the hypothesis were set kind of years ago at this point. Um, and so what it stemmed from was conversations that we were having with people where uh, actually, um, you know, it could be hard to find their dashboard among a lot of dashboards. Um, and when you talk to people, you kind of get the sense that, um, there are, are a lot of abandoned dash dashboards, um, but it's a little unclear why. And so when you dig in a little bit further and you're talking to more people, um, you understand that um, they're creating dashboards because they have one question. They have a quick question and it's not something they necessarily want to return to. Um, and so that's a, it's a pretty strongly held hypothesis. We've talked to enough, enough people. And what we found is when we dug into the data, we could measure that there are, you know, a ton of dashboards that people, um, uh, you know, created one graph on and then just never looked at again. And so um, what that leads us to is a product uh, that, you know, we're showing here, which is, uh, we internally call it a uh, graph from anywhere. Uh, the concept is if you could just create a graph that you didn't need to save, uh, it wasn't, you know, wasn't added to a list somewhere and you could save if you wanted to, or you could just abandon. Um, and the idea of this is to help people not feel the need to create, you know, a bunch of dashboards that have one thing on it um, and instead help you just get to that graphing experience faster. Yes, um, I have to say that, that I love this this feature. When when it first launched, it was like, yes, I want this. <laughs> um, I think it's super useful that actually anywhere from Datadog, you can type the letter G and it just appears. So that's super super helpful. Okay, so let's let's see how we are. Uh, let's 
go deeper into the topic uh, on on how we do this, how we gather that data at Datadog to make uh, those decisions. Um, so just in case some people are not familiar with, with RAM and session replay, so we are going to be talking about those, we are going to give uh, an overview of those tools so you know what they do and, and how they can be helpful. So you understand later on when we go into the examples of how we've been doing these exercises. We will talk a little bit as well about the methodology that we follow uh, for this. So, so if you want to replicate, you can you can use that as a base. Uh, so let's start with, with RAM, real use and monitoring. So Miranda, what's, what's RAM? Um, yeah, so uh, with the caveat that, um, you know, previously I worked on dashboards and data visualization, and I'm currently working on RAM and session replay. So um, uh, I have a vested interest here and in, in sharing this with everyone, but um, we use RUM um, to kind of answer a lot of questions. And so what RUM helps you do is view your web or mobile application from your user's perspective. So this is cross-device. Um, you, you know, it, it supports all the major browsers and, um, you know, mobile application types, uh, as well as some uh, TV operating systems. Um, and, you know, the goal is to help you do a couple different things. One of them is to view your overall performance of your of your application. The other one is to do um, things like error tracking, helping you understand how big your errors are. And the last one is to kind of like help with support. And so um, what we can do with, uh, with RUM um, ultimately, um, besides, you know, performance and, and uh, error tracking pieces, um, you can also do what are your users doing? Um, so this means, you know, how many people are coming to that particular web page and how many people are, um, you know, moving through a workflow that you would expect. Um, and so what RUM does is kind of tie all those pieces together and help you answer a lot of questions about your core web vitals. Um, so that affects your uh, SEO. Um, it organize all of the, you know, numerous errors that might be happening on your application and organizing them into a small set of issues. And um, helps you, you know, build dashboards and answer specific questions about user behavior. And so along with RUM is uh, a tool called Session Replay. Uh, session Replay allows users to view, you know, give a video-like replay of exactly what your users are doing. So this is, you know, a user might log in and click through the website. You can see where they're getting stuck. Yeah, this is a perfect example. Um, so you can see, you know, what they're clicking on, how, how, if they're hitting any errors on their front end and where are they hitting any hesitation? So um, for us, we use, we dog food everything internally. All of our product teams adopt any of the tools that they could potentially use. Um, they might potentially, you know, get a vendor for. Internally, we use everything for, that we build. <laughs> uh, so there's a strong culture of, of reusing a lot of these tools. And so for us, Session Replay does two things. Uh, one of them is to help identify any, uh, you know, understand if there is a bug. So if there is a bug, what did what did the user do? So a developer might use that to reproduce exactly what happened on the front end if they can't do so themselves. And for me as a product manager, I can use this as like a hypothesis building tool. So I'm going to um, you know, I, I might have a hypothesis that something, you know, some workflow is challenging. And so I'll go into that page and I'll watch um, exactly what people do to kind of like walk through that particular workflow. And um, we, as a caveat, the way we have tools to make this um, uh, more private. So we, uh, what we do is we, um, remove any of the text on the screen and replace it with uh, X's. So we don't see like the details of what people 
are searching for and querying, but we can see like where they're navigating, um, you know, which pages they're trying to get to, like if they were to be building a monitor, like did they successfully manage to get through that workflow? Um, so we, we look at it in like a user experience perspective rather than um, kind of like the details of the, of the pages. And another cool thing about session replay, I think, um, especially from a design perspective, is that like if you're doing, uh, if you're talking to users or you're sort of doing um, like a like a user feedback session or you're asking a user to walk you through how they might complete, you know, a certain workflow or a certain task, a lot of times users are are um, not there. A lot of times the feedback that you get in that sort of setting is not always totally accurate. It's like uh, users often have an inclination to like sort of tell you what they think you want to hear in a setting like that, unless you're really careful about, you know, um, making sure that you don't, you know, do things that are leading or whatever. But session replay, you can see, you know, you can sort of be a passive observer and see, you know, how a user is actually, um, you know, moving through a workflow or setting up a monitor, like I think you just mentioned, or, or whatever they're trying to do. Um, and you can get a sort of, you know, a real view of that kind of thing, um, which can be a really valuable thing as a designer. So nice. Uh, so now we've we've uh, talked uh, of run and session replay and a little bit how we use it internally. Uh, but uh, when when we have this hypothesis that you're talking about, how do we do end to end this type of exercises of confirming or? or or not um, this hypothesis. Yeah, I mean, I think like, so there's a couple really uh, underlying points here. One is that, and we sort of talked about this before a little bit, we don't want to feel rigid about this stuff. We don't wanna always feel like we're, we're questioning assumptions that maybe we had held before. We always wanna feel like we're in discovery mode or um, sort of open to, um, what data might be might be telling us in terms of validating or invalidating hypotheses that that we have. Um, that sounds maybe like when you say it out loud, it sounds maybe obvious, but I think it's a, a, actually an important thing to say out loud. Um, and then like the second part of it is, again, something that seems pretty obvious, but like, are we actually collecting, you know, once we once there's a hypothesis that's been formed and we're like, okay, what type of data might we want to use to try to validate this or flesh this out further? invalidate it. Um, are we actually collecting that data? Do we have that data? Um, a lot of times the answer is yes. Um, it depends on, you know, specifically what it is though. Um, sometimes you want to do, you know, you want to collect really targeted, you know, specific um, data about really specific user actions or, you know, specific things about what was displayed on a screen at a certain time or whatever it is. Um, one of the examples I'll talk about in a minute is a really specific thing like that. And, um, it's not something that we were like collecting data on. We had to, you know, instrument that in a, in a specific way to get to get what we needed. And we had to obviously ask that question before we, we started doing it. Like, are we collecting this data or not? Um, and then once you get that back or once you sort of, you know, it's time to analyze that and look at what it says, you know, it, it, do the results track with what you were expecting? Um, you know, a lot of times because, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of users and, and you know, uh, at Datadog, we're users of Datadog ourselves. A lot of times the data does track with what we expected. You know, users are consistently giving us feedback about X and they want to see such and such thing happen, or they're frustrated with, you know, this workflow that we could make better. And the data proves that in a lot of a lot of cases. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it tells us, you know, either the hypothesis we had was uh, or leads us to think it might be not as valid as we thought. Um, sometimes it tells us something really interesting, but it wasn't the sort of question we were trying to address in the first place. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, we, we look at it and we say, oh, like, should we apply this, this line of thinking or this sort of instrumentation of data collection to, to other places uh, in the app or to other projects or features? Um, so it's really about being open-minded and, and kind of um, willing to go where it says, but not like willing to go where it says blindly, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's also, um... So it's a way also to stay humble when you're designing. Like uh, you have you have a thought, but then uh, yeah. you actually try to to find out whether uh, that was correct or, or not. Yep, exactly. Okay, so 
let's uh, let's move to the most interesting part of, of, of this, I think, is which is uh, talking about a specific things that we've done at Datadog using Datadog to inform uh, changes in, in our product. So this, these are things that we use uh, RAM and, and session replay for. Uh, and let's start with an obvious one that can be, this probably is something that is on the mind that any uh, product designer or front-end engineer, um, when they're working on, on web application, which is uh, what type of browser do their users use and, and what type of sizes of the screen. Yeah, so right, like you said, this is something that, you know, as a designer, you want to be uh, you want to be aware of you know what types of what types of browsers are the users of your application or your website using you know most commonly um, different browsers and this is sort of getting uh, maybe a little bit better I don't know if better is the right word but a little bit better over the last uh, you know recent years but different browsers support different features um, they introduce support for different features at sort of different rates or cadences um, a lot of times. You know, you might want to take advantage of a certain feature that is only supported by, you know, uh, a specific version or or newer of, you know, this browser or that browser. And it's hard to decide, you know, whether you should build in support for those things or whether it's the right time to invest in something like that without knowing, you know, which browser, which browsers, which versions of those that your users are actually using in the real world. Um, and similar for like something like screen size or browser size. Um, you know, it's really helpful to know, um, especially working at Datadog, because this is a really interesting thing about Datadog, what, what size like monitor your users are working on. Um, there's a lot, you know, you, as from a design perspective, you think a lot about, oh, how is this design going to scale um, as a screen gets narrower? That's sort of just like a thing that in product design and, and web design in general, think about a lot. At Datadog, we have this interesting sort of case of going the other way where are the other way as well where uh as you see here these two graphs at the top they show uh like page views by screen width and screen height and the one on the left is screen width and it basically shows that like 20 percent, i think or 20 ish percent of um our users are on monitors that are like really big that are like desktop size you know flat screen widescreen monitors um and this is something that you know, gives you an opportunity as a designer. Maybe we can take advantage of this additional screen real estate to show, um, you know, contextual information about a specific workflow or to put other interesting sort of uh, elements or, you know, things that help users either interpret data or, um, you know, uh, complete a workflow more easily, you know, side by side with the main thing they're trying to do instead of just use it, having dead sort of unusable wasted space on their screen. Um, when we this so this dashboard here shows uh, a Datadog dashboard that is sort of uh, uses a feature that we internally called multi-size layout, and this was a feature that was developed I guess about a year ago or so, um, or re released about a year ago or so. And as we were building this feature internally, um, as the dashboards team was building this and designing this uh, on our team, Design Ops, we were using the sort of beta version of this to build this dashboard about. You know browsers and screen sizes and things like that and so we were giving feedback on the development of this this new feature and saying like oh you know um you know we maybe we could make an improvement here or it was tough to use this you know this new feature or this new interaction and we we're giving that feedback to the dashboards team and then to the rum team we were giving feedback too because we were trying to use and this is like a crazy meta thing but like we were trying to use that dashboard to figure out things about screen sizes and so we were giving feedback to the RUM team about, you know, here are the types of data we're looking for. Oh, this data, like we had to instrument ourselves. This might be something that users would find val valuable out of the box. Should we think about, you know, building in support for collecting this piece of information um, as a first class thing to data up? And then the information about those screen sizes was also something that helped the team building these dashboards figure out decisions about the dashboards themselves, like when to collapse into like a different mode of density, like when to make the the information on these screens more or less dense depending on the, the screen size of the browser. So it's this like really virtuous cycle um, in a really, really interesting way, I think. And um, and it's something that like you have to have this data to do in the first place. Um, and it's just there. And this is something that 
it, you know, we're always collecting the rum is always collecting this information by default. And uh, it helps us, it helps us like inform things on an ongoing basis. And um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting, uh, interesting thing, I think. Yeah. And I, I love that, um, you know, all of, all of the teams are kind of like sharing their experiences with each other. Uh, I, I think ultimately it, it makes the product better in the long term, just because we always have like consistent feedback loops, um, you know, uh, dashboards got better, rum got better, like design ops was able to like make more decisions. That's all helpful. Yes, duck, duck fooding is indeed uh, a big part of, of Datadog, which is uh, fantastic to see. Um, and actually, the this type of dashboard, we, we had an episode on, on Datadog on uh, earlier on, on Datadog on user experience, and we talked uh, particularly on, on how this was designed. So if you're interested in knowing a little bit more, uh, that was also a very, very interesting one. Yeah, it's super interesting and like very powerful and interesting from a technical and a design perspective. Like. I agree. <laughs> um, okay, the second the second example of um, which we we use these tools uh, was uh, Monospace uh, Font Family. Um, what is this about? Yeah, so this is this this is the thing I was referring to earlier when I said there was a really targeted use case and we had to instrument some really targeted data. So, um, in Datadog, in uh, a lot of different places in Datadog. We use monospace font, which is basically just, uh, you know, uh, characters that are all the same width. It's a pretty common staple. I think anybody viewing this um, uh, this episode is probably very familiar with it. You know, used in terminals and IDEs and you know um, things like that. But it's just a it's an easy way to to view structured data. You know, all the Datadog log messages are um, rendered in monospace font in the app. You know, things like JSON and structured stuff like that. So it's really prevalent throughout Datadog. Um, for a long time, it's something that we didn't define, uh, we didn't serve a monospace font to users. Um, basically, we just, and you see the highlighted line here, um, this is like C, the CSS expression of how uh, monospace font used to be rendered in Datadog. We used the font stack, which is basically just like a set of rules that say, if the user has this font installed on their machine, render monospace font in that. If they don't, see if they have the next one installed and render and render the font in that and so on and so on down the line. And that's okay. But we really wanted to, um, uh, we wanted to figure out and serve a specific font to users because uh, especially in something like Datadog, um, different monospace fonts have sort of different sizes, even if they say they're the same font size. Um, and that means that there's a big difference in the amount of density of information that can be seen in a specific screen or a specific element, um, you know, in, in one font that's nominally the same size as another one, you know, information may be clipped sooner than in another one and things like that. From a design perspective, that's something that, you know, um, uh, ideally we would want to know a little bit better. We would want to know um, that all users were sort of having the same experience if possible. And uh, so what we did was we used Datadog to, uh, we wanted to figure out what font we could serve to users that would provide the least, that would be most similar to the font that the most number of users were already seeing. So, so to visually disrupt the fewest number of users in the, in the smallest way. Um, to be able to do that, we had to know actually of those fonts in that stack that you showed a few slides ago, which ones users were actually seeing the most often. Um, and this is something that, um, that you can get. You can, you can figure out uh, how to use this data by basically using the CSS font loading API. And uh, you can attach this information to RUM events in Datadog. So you can say, you know, whenever a user views a page, um, use the CSS font loading API, see actually the font that the, that the user uh, saw this screen on in their own, on their own machine. And you can attach that to the RUM event. And that's like a, a piece of context that we can then view and graph in RUM. So this is like the code that we used to instrument that. This is how it looks in, in Datadog. Once we inst or instrumented installed that code, um, we collected it for a little while. Um, we saw that, uh, not surprisingly, the, the font that was seen the most often by the most number of users was the one that was installed by default on Macs. 
um, which I think was of the ones in that list was Menlo here, the dark purple um, group at the bottom, which is not something that was surprising because we knew from the other RUM analytics that like, I think more than 50% of Datadog users are using Max. So, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise that the highest number of users were seeing the font that's installed on a Mac. So anyway, that was something that we used. We, we figured out, okay, then which font can we serve um, that's the closest in sort of visual characteristics to that, so that the fewest number of users would have a disruptive experience when we switched. Um, and we did that, and uh, everything went pretty seamlessly, smoothly. Um, we didn't get any sort of user feedback, complaints about it. So it was a, a really, really interesting and targeted sort of like surgically targeted, targeted case. Uh, we removed the code for this once we were done. We didn't need to figure that stuff out anymore. Um, but uh, it was... It was pretty cool, I thought, and it was a, a pretty interesting way of using RUM from a design and front end perspective. Yes, it's uh, it's very interesting to see uh, from a knowing designer point of view, like myself, to see uh, how uh, how much care you put into into changes to avoid. Usually, like you think about designing for people to notice. In this case, it's completely the opposite. It's designing for people to not notice, which is uh, <laughs> fairly interesting. Yeah. Cool. The, the, the last one that we that we had uh, is, is this one, which is custom time frame syn syntax. And um, time frames is something that uh, this dropdown has been in Datadog uh, from, from ever. Um, so what's what's the difference in here? Yeah, so this one this one is especially cool, I think. Basically, like you said, uh, the ability to scope data in Datadog has been a you know a feature of Datadog since since forever since Datadog started, um, and that's you know you're looking at a graph, you're looking at a dashboard, you're looking at you know data from the Log Explorer or the RUM um, the RUM Explorer page or whatever page you might be looking at. You want to, in many cases most cases scope that data down to a specific time range you know whether that's the past day the past few hours um uh, something longer something specific but corresponding to something you're investigating you know a time frame that corresponds to an incident or whatever it might be um it's a really important feature of using a platform like datadog for a long time we only let we only provided the option for user, users to pick from a preset list of time frames so that's like the version on the left here um you, we would provide, you know, a set of a handful of options. Um, say you're looking at this dashboard. You can view, you know, the past hour of data. You can view the past four hours, the past day, whatever. Um, but uh, but you couldn't do anything different than the options we provided to you. And it's a piece of feedback we got from users over and over and over. Like I want to be able to set a custom time frame um, in a in a, in a way that's easy. You know, I have a lot, a lot of different users have different use cases for that. So we ended up building in uh, the ability for users to type in custom timeframes, like you see here on the right, um, with sort of arbitrary strings that 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 they were sort of using to express the time frame they wanted to see. So whether that's something like more like a human term like yesterday, or you know this month, or um, something like that, or something like a date format like. Uh, July 1st, July 1st to July 2nd, things like that. We wanted to kind of be able to interpret and cover as many possible types of inputs um, as users were going to put in and, and figure out what they meant by that and then present back the sort of uh, start and end timestamp to them that that bounds the, the data or the graph that they were looking at or whatever the thing was. Um, it's It's pretty tricky because there's a lot of different ways that people can uh, that people can express time and that people express time in their heads when they're trying to, to sort of write something like this quickly, especially. Um, and we needed to figure out, basically, uh, we, we wanted to cover, like I said, the, the highest number of potential inputs that they have, but it's not magic. We had to sort of write rules and logic for any types of syntaxes that we could think of that users were going to put in. So what we did was we started with, you know, uh, a bunch of syntaxes that we felt like were going to be uh, common or that users had requested. So like yesterday or a date with a number, you know, a month with a date after it or whatever. Um, and we added those to to the support for this for this control. Um, and at the same time, we instrumented 
uh, tracking of when a user typed in something and pressed enter, uh, if what they typed in was something we didn't know how to parse that we registered as invalid, uh, we, tr we tracked that that happened and what the thing that they entered, what, the, what they tried to enter, what text string. Um, and we graphed that and we kept, it, keep an, kept an eye on it. And we launched this feature. And at the, when we launched about 10% of the, the things that people typed in and pressed enter were invalid. And so we had a hypothesis that a really common thing that we didn't support at first was the ability to do uh, weeks. So to type in one week, two weeks, you know, past, past week, things like that. Um, that's a really sort of human form that uh, we thought people would think of, um, especially like in a reporting style context. And we figured that um, that would be something that we could build in support for pretty easily. And we wanted to see if doing so would make a meaningful difference in the, in the error rate, basically. So we did that. We built in support for weeks and things like W, so 1W, 2W. We released it and like almost immediately the error rate of, of invalid syntax is dropped to like around 5%. Um, and that was like, it was a very clearly as a result of the change that we made, it was like, it was very satisfying <laughs> to see, honestly. And um, it's something that we continue to keep an eye on. We have some hypotheses for other syntaxes that we think are, uh, people want to be able to, to use that we don't support yet. And we're keeping an eye on those that's past the bottom of this screenshot. But we have some other uh, graphs on this page that show that kind of thing. And we keep an eye on like, users from different countries, um, how users who are from countries that express dates in different formats, um, how their sort of rates of errors for this component change are different from each other. Um, and it's also something that we're like, you know, this stays pretty steady over time if we don't make changes to the functionality of this. And if we do, uh, and something like the error rate spikes back up, then we've definitely made like a problem. And that's something that we can see very quickly too. So, uh, it's a really cool way, I think, to get some really, really targeted, interesting um, data and use it in an ongoing basis to help to help us continue to develop something that users use all the time. Yeah, and I think I think it's very interesting that you showed two different examples, one in which you instrumented something that you want, like the phone, uh, the people were using, something that you instrumented to grab the data for a while and then drop it. And this type of instrumentation that you keep keep for a while. Yep. Cool. So um, I want uh, Miranda to, to talk to us a little bit more about um, how all this dog footing that, that we do at Datadog um, help us improve also not only the thing that we are targeting, but also run a session replay, which, which are the tools uh, that uh, our, our front-end teams are, are using. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we talked about it like very briefly earlier. Everything, every tool that we have within Datadog is, is used and dog-fooded as much as possible internally. And one of the interesting, you know, things is, you know, we want to talk to our customers as much as possible and we want to know you know, what their challenges and what their day-to-day, -day, you know, workflows are like. Uh, but we can only get so much information. So sometimes when a customer reaches out to us, it's only when something's like very wrong <laughs> or like there's like something that's like a like very extremely strong need, which we want to solve those problems, obviously. <laughs> uh, but um, those like small, medium-sized improvements that maybe somebody has a work around, um, and they're able to get it done in, in less than ideal way that might not come to us proactively. Um, so we have to, we, or, you know, retroactively, uh, we might, we have to be proactive about like going, finding, you know, what those, what those challenges are. Um, and dog fooding is an interesting opportunity to do that. Um, so um, like, for example, you know, Derek, showed that he had built custom things to get um, screen size and width. Um, and because you can build custom things into RUM, customers could do that themselves. They didn't need us to, to build that for them to get it done. But um, what we wanna do is we wanna, we want things to work out of the box. Like we want these like obvious, um, obvious pieces to, um, to be easily available. I, I don't 
like when when building a product I, I don't want people to like spend a ton of time instrumenting things uh, if they don't have to and so um, internal feedback and internal dog fooding is really helpful for that because you know our internal developers are willing to tell us any small thing that they might find uh might find wrong which is great uh and then we can use that in our customer conversations to kind of validate so you know we get it we hear something internally we we double check it with our customers um to see if they're also uh having similar challenge or how widespread this is um so you know a lot of what we end up you know, building custom internally uh, can end up, um, you know, available to the public. Um, we also mostly take a lot of feedback from our customers, but we consider our internal uh, developers as customers as well. Sounds, um, sounds good. Um, uh, so, uh, what, anything else there? I don't know. I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was about to say, like, there are things that even though we can't build out of the box, like the is Datadog employee can be something that we suggest to people when we, when we onboard. So we use it as like also as a training exercise. Yeah, exactly. Like you don't want to type in, if you're, if you're trying to use rum as a Datadog customer, um, and maybe you want to filter out your own employees because you really want to focus on your customer's data. It's pretty tedious to type every time you're trying to type a query, like, you know, exclude emails that end in my email, my company's email address or, or my, you know, our domain or whatever. But if you could just build that in and then have it be, you know, an attribute that you just filter off with a checkbox, um, that saves a lot of time over a lot of, uh, you know, doing that same workflow. Uh, if yeah. You save that much every time it adds up. So. Good. Uh, so we are about to get to the Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, again, uh, I, I see that some of them are already coming in. So thanks for that. If you have any questions, please use the, the Q&A button um, and leave the question there. We are going to, to go through them um, in, in a second. Uh, before we do that, um, I want to finish the session by asking Miranda and Derek um, if people want to do something similar uh, for their application. So uh, gathering and using data to, to help them inform uh, decisions. Uh, what would be your number one suggestion on, on where to start, on how to start? Miranda, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I, I would number one suggest, um, you know, talking to as many people as possible. It's something we've emphasized a lot like knowing who and what you're solving for before you start building something is super important. Uh, if you're, if, if you don't know what you're solving for, your projects can just last forever and nothing else ever gets shipped. Um, but if you know who you're building for, what you're building, then you can use this, you can figure out like what data you need to answer questions, like what are your blockers? Um, so if you start with that solid foundation, then, um, uh, it kind of informs everything else. Thanks, Derek. Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, I think for my very specific answer is, uh, if you're a designer, um, and especially if your company is using Datadog, think of yourself as an active participant in this process. Um, it's something that you can use as a designer. Um, you know, you don't have to be super technical to to use it, um, but you can get really, really valuable insights. Uh, for the design process from Datadog and tools like this and using things to to, to look at real user uh, behavior and, and real user monitoring. So think of yourself as an active participant in that process and don't think like, oh, it's just something for engineers or or it's just something for somebody else. And, you know, I'll just kind of passively be part of this. And, and also when you're working on a, you know, as a designer on a day-to-day -day basis, always be thinking about the types of you know, hypotheses that you hypotheses that you have, and you know what data you might need to try to help validate those or or help address those, and um, and you know, like I said originally, do we have that data is a is an important question, and sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the it's not going to get you're not going to get it unless you speak up and and say this is what I need and this is what I'm looking for, and, and like I said, be an active participant in that process, and that's my guess number one piece of advice. 
Nice. Uh, thanks. Thanks for those insights. Uh, so we are going to go to for Q and A. Uh, but uh, before that, thank you. Thank you very much for for attending the session. Again, this is being recorded, so it's going to be published on our website very very soon. Um, and if you think these these problems are interesting for you, uh, please check out our careers page. We have a lot of openings uh, for designers, product managers, engineering, etc. Let's let's start with the with the Q and A. Uh, so uh, the first one that we got from the audience, uh, Don is asking, uh, we are starting an, an evaluation of RAM, and we need higher level metrics such as which users that started the trial ended up purchasing the product. Does that ad hoc support that type of high level analysis of user actions? Um, yeah. So um, I figure I'll take this one. Uh, um, you know, you, what you saw like that um, Derek did with the um, monospace was a good example of this. Um, you can set custom either metadata about the user uh, as well as individual actions that they took that you like deem important. So what you can do is create your own custom uh, action that's like user start a trial, and then later, you know, user ended up purchasing. So you could create those two events. Um, and because Datadog is extremely flexible, you can run queries where you do, you know, the count of people who purchased divided by the count of people who who trialed. Um, so so you can use that data to do that measurement essentially. Good. Thanks. Um, so. Another question is that, uh, and and back to I think uh, this is also very interesting about going back again to to booting. Uh, so you mentioned some of those attributes that uh, we needed to, to instrument at the beginning that are needed to instrument at the beginning, like uh, screen size, etc., that ended up being uh, part of the product. Um, how does that ad hoc and particularly product management chooses? which one of those things uh, that uh, that adoc uses internally ends up being part of the product and i think probably this this goes back to talking to the rest of customers yeah um this one like kind of depends on the nature of the change um so if it's something that like is like a decision like if if we were to release this feature would it have an impact on something else later um, if it's simply like this is a new, this is more data that we can collect, um, usually a no brainer. Um, you know, we'll look around in the industry and, and, and see like how widespread people are, how people are answering that question. But um, if it's if it's something a little more foundational, we'll spend more time validating that with um, with our customers. So we want to know. We want to make sure that we're building the right thing for people. It solves the right challenge for them or, or more universally. Um, it's possible we come up with a solution for ourselves that works for us, but doesn't work for everybody. So sometimes the feature kind of morphs a little bit to be more generic, uh, you know, for all of our customers. Yeah. And I think just to add on to that point, I, I think it's really important to say, you know, you talked a lot about dog fooding. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's a really valuable thing for us. And it's something that we have gotten so many insights out of for so many years. But it's also something that, we, that you have to be careful about because um, if you're using your own product every day to monitor your own product and help build your own product, you're coming at it from a different, you're just inherently coming at it, at it from a different angle than users maybe. And so you have to make sure that you're not sort of over biasing on your own experience in that way and you have to you know remember that there's a lot of other people using this product and they're coming from a lot of different you know uh, angles from you potentially um so that's something, especially from a design perspective i think that's something that it's it's really important to keep telling yourself so sounds good uh so we don't have any more questions so um Thanks everyone for attending again, and thanks uh, Derek and Miranda for for sharing your your expertise and, and your knowledge. And uh, see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.